I haven't been struck by the kind of despair that many people feel of, I'm going to die. I have been afraid of losing purpose. I really want to be engaged in doing something that helps and serves. And trying to figure out what that is has been, I wouldn't say a struggle, but every so often I sort of, you know, I sort of lose a grip on it. I'm Deborah Jarvis, and you're listening to The Final Say, Conversations with People Facing Death. This is the podcast where you can get comfortable talking about death and learn some things about life from people who are facing death. My guest in this episode is Dr. Bill Gardner. Bill is a child psychologist at the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario in Ottawa, Canada. Yes, I am going international. He is a professor of psychiatry and epidemiology at the University of Ottawa, where he holds a research chair in child and adolescent psychology. In July of 2020, he was diagnosed with throat cancer. So I'll let him tell that story. I was just, you know, kind of working along. And in the early months of 2020, I started coughing and having trouble swallowing. You know, and I'm a medical school professor and I'm married to another medical school professor. So we knew what that could mean. And we tried to get get me worked up for a cancer diagnosis. But this was the beginning of COVID. So everything shut down and we could not get an evaluation. So eventually in early July, the tumor in my throat broke through the tissue and I started um, coughing up a lot of blood, went to an emergency department. And bang, they correctly diagnosed me. And then um, we got things moving fast then. And since then, I had an initial treatment of radiation. That gave me a few good months, but very quickly the tumor came back. It turns out that the kind of cancer I have, most of the time it's successfully treatable, but if it's not, it's really bad. We were still in a situation where they weren't allowing visitors. So Kathy was on the phone. I bet I was in an exam room. I was meeting with an ear, nose, nose and throat surgeon. And, and he was an appropriate person to meet with because his view, because of where my cancer happens to be, it's, it, it's effectively inoperable. And, and it was important to hear that. But yes, I mean, he sort of said, you know, we don't think there's much more we can do for you. So the primary options I want to tell you about right now are palliative care or medical assistance in dying. I mean, of course it was difficult to hear. Um, On the other hand, it it wasn't like this is the first time I'd met with him. He knew I was a colleague. He knew I was part of the medical system that, and that I think he felt to some degree that he could just give me the unvarnished facts. And I, there's something to that. I felt a certain amount of respect there. If, it, if that's the way he treats most patients, though, I'd, I think I'd want him disciplined. How could he have done it better? Well, first of all, there's a, there's a real question about whether you should offer it at all versus respond to a patient's request. There's great controversy about this. There is a school of thought in Canada that this is a right everyone to, to, to end your life in the, these situations. Uh, everyone should know about it. If they don't know about it, you have to tell them. There's another school of thought that I'm more sympathetic to, which is that medical assistance in dying is a last resort for people whose suffering is just at the extreme and they their needs cannot be addressed in any other way. And if someone is not asking for this, the question is, are, are, are they really in that sort of situation? And then, you know, I'm a, um, a fairly devout Christian, so I wasn't in any kind of uncertainty about how I was going to play, play this out. I've done an episode 
on this podcast about medical aid in dying, and I understand the reluctance for both patients and doctors to bring it up. For patients, sometimes it's just too unbelievable to think about. It's just too painful. So then they are really grateful when their doctor mentions it. And then there are other times when the doctor doesn't want to be seen as someone who gives up on their patients. So then they are grateful when a patient mentions it. My experience has been that most patients, almost all patients with serious illnesses, they know about medical aid and dying. It's already on their radar screen. So perhaps it's more a matter of how and when the information is presented. I want to go back to your spiritual beliefs that you mentioned would prevent you from asking for medical aid in dying. So tell me about your spiritual beliefs. What were you raised and where are you now with all that? I was raised in a bunch of different Protestant churches. Uh, my father was an atheist. My mother um, was um, was Christian. I went through various periods during adolescence and college where uh, particularly because I was I was in high school during the late 60s and then college during the early 70s. Uh, it was a wild time. I got was distant from the church without fully renouncing anything. And then very quickly after I left college, I went back. The place I eventually went back was this church I liked the most among the um, ones that I was taken to growing up, which was uh, the Episcopal Church, and then here in Canada, uh, the Anglican Church. Um, and and it's mostly because I just love the Book of Common Prayer liturgy and, you know, um, early British sacred music, you know, Thomas Tallis and all, all of this. I just, I just, I just think it's fantastic. Do you feel like you've gotten closer to God since this diagnosis? Sure. In the sense of, I mean, well, so again, uh, Augustine would say, right, he said famously, God is closer to me than I am to myself. Okay, but since I wasn't talking with St. Augustine, I wanted to know if Bill felt closer to God. I thought, surely he would get to that. But then he talked about other well-known religious figures. I um, I went I went back and reread a lot of Thomas Merton and um, the Rule of Saint Benedict. And then he talked about Father Pedro Arupe. He's possibly the first first responder at Hir Hiroshima. He was a Jesuit missionary in Japan uh, in 1945 in Hiroshima when the bomb was dropped. And because he had originally uh, trained as a physician, he, you know, gathered up was you know the staff that he could and went into the city as soon as the fire uh, permitted, and found a lot of people and saved a lot of lives. What is it about his life and his actions that struck you? Well, first, the first thing I ran into was this extraordinary quote from a speech that was read for him at the end of his life. Okay, but he still hasn't Jesus. answered the question, How do you feel closer to God? But I know that sometimes well, it takes people a while to get to their and, answer, and, and I can be so very patient. Me, so I was um, pretty patient um, and listened mean, for a long uh, time about Father Arupe and his moral excellence. And, is, and then um, I couldn't be patient life. anymore. Okay, I'm, I'm going to just person. interrupt you because I'm more interested in you, Bill. And, uh, and Arupe, mwah, God bless him. But I yeah. want to know, like, what gives your life meaning and purpose now? Where are you finding joy in the face of this uncertainty. So, so, yeah, I mean, I, I, so you're doing a great job here. Obviously, I'm reluctant to talk about myself. And, but thank you, thank you for working so hard to, to, on a difficult task. I'm not, I'm not a good patient in therapy, by the way, even though I'm a psychologist, for exactly this reason. <laughs> uh, but but you're, you're doing great. Okay, so. Um, 
I want to know how you feel emotionally. I haven't been struck by the kind of despair that many people feel of, I'm going to die. I have been afraid of losing purpose. I really want to be engaged in doing something that helps and serves. And trying to figure out what that is has been, I wouldn't say a struggle, but every so often I sort of, you know, I sort of lose a grip on it. Well, and there's that question of identity, especially I think for you, Bill, who's been an academic and had some success. And can you still be who you are at your deepest self as you get less and less able to do the things that defined you? Well, that, that's a great way to put the question. Very, very well put. No, it's involved shifting what I think I can do. Like I, I'm trying to finish a couple of the projects that are close enough to finish, but a bunch of the things I was working on, I've just had to let go. And it was difficult. It was very difficult. So instead, you know, I started writing about cancer. On the one hand, it was difficult because it was a kind of writing, a kind of personal writing that I'd never done before. It was, you know, you're sort of writing memoir. It's, a, it's an entirely different, I mean, it's some yeah. of the writing skills carry over, but it's very different. I was also trying to write about religion, which is a little bit difficult in that, um, uh, you know, I'm in this very secular world of science and there are a certain number of people who, who when the, you tell them what you believe, you can sort of see them, their eyes deduct 15 IQ points. Um, I, can, I can live with that. But the, the main thing is, I don't know what I'm talking about, right? So I've been educating myself in public in a certain way. And every so often I look back about something I wrote five months ago and I think, oh, that's embarrassing. Please, it's not embarrassing because I've read your stuff and I think it's wonderful. And it, as I read your stuff, I want to say that it felt to me as if as you're writing, you're on a journey of self-discovery. Like you may not even know what you think and feel until you're sitting down and you're having to give voice to it. Oh, yes. No, no. That, that, and that's the great thing about writing for me and, and, and for many other writers. I know that how do you figure out what you think and feel? And part of it comes to you in the moment and, and, and that can be authentic and true. Part of it also, you have to reflect and, you know, try to see, well, does that really fit with the other things? I, it's, a, it's a really, really useful process. Well, tell me, what's, what's your best case scenario for your death now? I mean, do you want to like suddenly die out in the woods with your dog? You want to be on a deathbed with your family around? I mean, when you think about actually leaving your body, where what kind of image comes to mind? How do you feel? You know, I haven't thought about that very much, as funny as it sounds, because I actually feel healthy enough that even though things might deteriorate quickly, it doesn't feel that imminent. I don't have any aversion to being in a hospital. I want to... I guess being in the place where I can have I can have the best experience of being with whoever's there. And so it seems possible that that could be in a hospital. Who do you want there? I want whoever wants to be there to be there. If somebody said, I can't do this, I would say, that's fine. I know you love me. And I, and I wouldn't take it as any kind of disloyalty or anything like that. On the other hand, um, yes, everything else being equal for them, sure, I'd like, you know, people there. Um, now that's, that would end up, that could end up being a lot of people. <laughs> <laughs> Yankee Stadium is open for Bill Gardner. <laughs> Tell me what you believe happens when you die. Like, where do you go? 
Uh, so that's a great, very challenging question. And of course, the first answer I'll give is the chicken one, which is, I don't really know. That's an honest one. Yeah, but but it's but it's 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 an easy one too. So it's more like a hope that the things that I affirm each week before the Eucharist, you know, when we recite the Apostles' Creed, really are going to work out. That there will be a resurrection and and that. And it's bigger than my job description to try to understand that. Does does that make any sense? Well, it makes tons of sense. And I think your first answer, I don't know, is valid. And I think your second answer is, I really want to believe that everything I'm taught as a Christian is also true. I believe it more than that. I mean, that makes makes it sound like I'm like I'm a, I'm a coin flip. No, I really believe in God. I feel like I've known his presence. So it's possible God could do a lot of stuff. I don't think God will be a torturer. But what God certainly could do is expose us to our lives. He could just expose us to what we caused. That would be very, very difficult experience. That would be hell right there. Tell me about an experience that you've had where you felt close to God, because you spoke about that earlier. One was when I was um, an adolescent. Uh, I had a, I had a, a sort of brief but intense uh, substance use problem in um, high school. After that was over, one night, I was out walking in in the summer, and I just had one of these experiences where suddenly I just fell down into the grass, and it was the kind of thing that everyone sort of speaks about of, you know, suddenly there's no difference between you and the stars kind of thing. And I don't even know how long it lasted, but a neighbor was walking by and said, are you okay? And I got up and said, oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm, and, but, but that was just sort of like, oh, so this is God. What do you think you've learned about yourself on this journey? Well, I've learned the degree to which in my prior life, I was hung up with things that now seem to be really false idols. Like what? You know, I was a, a research scientist working on very practical things in child and youth mental health. In order to make a career doing that, you have to be constantly competing for money, for getting your publications in and things like this. So I got very obsessed with tracking all that stuff. Who is citing me? How often am, am my works getting cited? How many publications? I, I was really, really excited when, for example, we finally got a publication in the New England Journal. But it's an, these are idols, right? You know, Calvin says the mind is an idol factory. Believe me. And it all is part of this merit meritocracy out there, right? Where you're trying for the kind of excellence. And I'm I'm all for excellence. I'm very proud of things that we worked on. I always tried to do things the hard way because it would make me stronger. Okay. But there's always implicitly in that the other people who aren't doing that is somehow lesser. And and as I saw the degree to which to which I was valuing what I did and not valuing if I'd opened my eyes I could have seen a lot of other people around me doing that don't have these high status social things that come to you from that like the title of professor and such like I would have been better off My my uh, sister in law died recently um, of an accident, and oh, I'm sorry. Well, yeah, it was a real loss, uh, particularly for my brother. You know, when I I was aware of how much she had done for other people, but when I stopped to reflect on it and and thought about 
how many people in her neighborhood she took care of, how many other people in her family she took care of. And, you know, she, she had flaws, but these things are invisible. If you're too focused on your own track through things, you don't see these things. So that's something I learned about myself. How has it been for Kathy, your wife? How's she doing with all this? Oh, it's really complex. So, of course, as a physician, she's you know much more familiar familiar with death than than I am. She's been incredibly strong. We've had a lot of very deep conversations about you know our relationship and our marriage. All constructive, but one issue that came up that I really learned a lot from her was an interesting one, where not all of our um, interactions with the physicians have been bad news. Occasionally, there's good news, like, you know, you take an uh, endoscopy of the tumor, and it's a little bit smaller. So we had one of those recently. And she was instantly overjoyed. And I was happy, but restrained. Why? Interesting. Is that usual for you? It is to some degree. And it's because in almost everything where there's some sort of high stakes thing going to happen, I try to cultivate, I'm going to be okay with this, however it comes out. If it goes badly, I'm not going to fall off my chair. If it goes really well, I'm not going to fall off my chair. I see. So just maintaining kind of an even That's balance. right. Okay. I mean, a lot of people could say, no, it's perfectly okay to be really happy if good things happen. Maybe maybe because I have spent some time, um, I, I studied with Buddhists um, and learning how to meditate, and I really learned immense amount. And there's a sort of detachment from things that they teach. And I found it useful. But... She felt hurt. That you weren't more joyful? That I wasn't more joyful. And I understand 100% why. Because her first thought was, oh, Bill and I get more time together. That's exactly what I was thinking. Yeah. Oh, no, no, yeah. it's, you're, you have it exactly right. And I was thinking, okay, that's good. I get some more time. There's more things we can do. That's fine. And we... We talked about that feeling and I realized she she has every reason to feel that way. And I have, you know, tried to, I mean, I, I have always, I, th I think we've always had, people talk about us that we're kind of gooey with each other in terms of always, you know, we're always saying I love you and we're kind of walk around holding hands and, and things like that. I just realized, no, you have to do that. That's how you have to take each of the you have to take each day with each day you get with the people who really mean a lot to you they have to know how much you mean to them and that was a really good lesson for me have you been able to talk to Kathy about you know your impending death and be open about that or are you still kind of like yeah I don't think so much about that where are you guys with that no no we're not with that if I could give a reason not to talk about it it's that I I think we're both confident that when it is time we can uh also we don't know exactly what the issues will be of course of course nobody does Nobody does, and either psychologically or medically. So we're just trying to stay in, we're staying in close touch with each other. Now, maybe everybody thinks this and, and it all takes them by surprise and they've lost opportunities. I will raise this question with her that you're posing me now. Should we be talking about this now? We've talked about the funeral. We've talked about, you know, we've done all the sort of legal things that need to be done. Yeah, that's the outside stuff. That stuff is, that's pretty easy. That's the outside stuff. No, no, I, 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 you, I take your point. Yeah. Well, it's a tender subject. It, it for sure will bring up 
a lot of emotions. And I guess one of the reasons I'm asking you is because I'm looking at this quote from the article you wrote, Cancer in Advent, and I love this. And you said, make the joys of life impervious to fear because I already accounted for death. And so I'm like, oh, well, Bill, that means that you must have been talking about it and thinking about it. And But now it kind of sounds like maybe not. No, no. Um, I haven't talked about it that much with her. I know how I want to face death. I, I, I want to be impervious to fear, but not because I want to be some sort of hero. I want to, to be able to express as much love as I can in that moment and in those moments. So I want to, to the degree I can reach out, I want to. It's really, really hard to know what practically that will involve. Oh, no, I think it's impossible to know, for, for anybody to know. It's important, it's important to be strong, in part because you want to set an example for other people that, no, there's still good things. You know, your life now is short, but there's still many, many good things to have in it. And I want I want to send that message that there's there's no reason to give up. There's no reason. There's I think there's reasons. I don't, I, I don't want to encourage people to get attached to the idea of oh there'll be something that'll cure me. No, eventually that's not the case. You're going to die eventually, and it might be now. What I want to say is that shouldn't take anything away from the life you still have. How have you managed to wrap your mind around the idea of Bill no more? Suppose everything in the, the you know Christians think about the um, or the Buddhists for that matter think about the future past your death uh, isn't true and it's we're just completely extinguished. So what? I'm with you there. I mean I mean <laughs> like okay. So that's how it worked out. Yeah. I'm, I'm sorry I didn't get more chance to go skiing. You know, I, I really, really, you know, would have loved to have some more, uh, uh, you know, fettuccine with the, or tagliatelle with ragu. Uh, uh, you know, the sex was great. Could have had more of that. But, you know, it's it's gone. You know, OK, there's, well, there's not going to be anybody around regretting this. Let me ask you this, then, just because you mentioned food. Um, if, of course, we don't know, uh, as you said, what's going to happen and what it's going to look like when you die. But if they said, OK, Bill, you're still able to eat and drink all you want. What would you choose for a last meal? Oh, that's a great question. Have you been to Rome? Yes. Okay. Uh, did you visit uh, the Pantheon? Yes. Okay. So there's this little uh, tutorial right off the square in front of the um, uh, the Pantheon, which is now, of course, a Christian church of some kind. Yeah. And we came into Rome really late one night and got a meal there, and. I got a carbonara, very common dish. But I, I took a bite and I said, this is the carbonara I've been waiting for my whole life. <laughs> I mean, this is incredible. And before my throat went bad, I, I enjoyed uh, Italian wines and things like that. So yeah, something like that. OK, uh, so you heard it here, carbonara and a good red wine. Anything else? Tiramisu? You know, I um, my sister just came back from uh, Sorrento, and mm. she said that she had a tiramisu there that was just incredible. And I said, you know, the stuff you get here is just such drack. I don't really like it. But but if I could have the one she had, sure. Okay, okay. Well, it's good to be specific about these things. So. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So let me ask you this. So people listening to this podcast, the final say, conversations with people facing death, what would you want them to know? Anything that 
like was helpful to you or inspiring or even like a big question you have? I don't know. What what do you want somebody listening to this podcast to take away? Here's the thing that I would say that we haven't mentioned. And and this is partly for people who have family or friends who get cancer. I think people are sometimes afraid to approach them. Like they're very sick. What do I say? What if I say the wrong thing? And my message is show up. That's that's all you have to do. That's what matters. You may make a mistake, but show up. That's and I don't think I really try to take the view that there's nothing wrong to say. Nobody knows how to nobody knows what to say. Forgive them. It's okay if they say the wrong thing. They showed up. Appreciate that. That's that's sort of in a piece of advice. That's the thing about my own experience professionally and personally is that people don't want to be around people who get a serious diagnosis because it just reminds them that I too am going to die at some point. There's no getting around it. There's so many ways in which we do not, all of us do not adequately value the end of life and being in the hospital. Of course, that is one of the problems that we have, that death is left everyday experience and it becomes something invisible behind an institutional wall. And, and I wouldn't at all mind dying at home if I can. If I can't, that's fine. With the kind of collapse of uh, religion for most people, you know, we don't have good scripts to get us through the end of life. And we don't have good scripts for remembering people after they're gone. So it's regrettable, but you know, I hope my death is gonna go well. So here's my final say for today. I too hope Bill's death goes well and he gets some excellent spaghetti carbonara and tiramisu before he exits our planet. Bill gave some really good advice about showing up for one another. And I think this is important advice, not just around giving support and sharing sorrow, but also around rejoicing and sharing joy because sometimes it's hard for us to share in someone else's joy, as weird as that seems. And I also agree with Bill that we don't get good scripts for getting through the end of life. So I hope this podcast will help you with that. Bill is a wise and excellent writer, and you can find his writing on billgardner.substack.com. I have some serious news is the title of his blog. And I'll leave that link in the transcripts to this episode that you can find on the website, which is thefinalsaypodcast.com. This has been The Final Say, Conversations with People Facing Death. First of all, thanks to Dr. Bill Gardner for being so generous with his time and patient with my questions. The Final Say is hosted, produced, and edited by me, Deborah Jarvis. And as always, thanks to Blue Dot Sessions, who provides music. Please feel free to hop over to thefinalsaypodcast.com and email me with feedback, questions, ideas, stories, Are you or do you know someone who is facing death and would like to be a guest? Let me know. Let me know what you thought of today's episode. Let me know how you're doing. What's up with you? And of course, the usual. Subscribe, follow this podcast and share. And of course, I really appreciate you leaving a review wherever you get your podcasts. That helps a lot to get more people listening to these amazing stories. So thanks again, 
And I hope you find beauty and joy in your day to day. And I've had my final say, but you know what? There's still a final goodbye. And take care and we'll just be in touch, okay? Thank you. I, I look forward to seeing this. This has been episode. wonderful, Bill. I it's been a great conversation and, and I've taken a lot away from it and we'll think hard about many of the things we've discussed. Okay. Give my best to your wife and kiss your dog on the lips for me. Um, <laughs> we're, we're actually I'm not on quite those terms, but. Uh, <laughs> well, you could do it the other way around if you want. <laughs> okay. Yeah, All that's, right. that's okay. Take care. Take care. Bye bye. Bye bye.